All right, John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, I'll begin at verse 5. John chapter 6, beginning at verse 5. My subject this morning is loneliness, or never alone. John 6, 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Sometime the Lord asks you to pray just to see how you feel about it and just to see if you're honest with yourself. He already knows what's going to be. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith to him, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in that place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. When you read about the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, there always seems to be a mob around, or the multitude. Crowd has followed him wherever he went. You wouldn't think he ever had any time alone. You wouldn't think he had any private life. There's always a mob there. But keep reading. Eleven, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he saith to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above, and of them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Now my text, verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Himself alone. Father, bless the message this morning and minister to the hearts of lonely men and women that may hear this message, both here in our uh, auditorium and out over the airwaves, up and down this country. May the Holy Spirit of God, the Comforter who was sent to come and bring us comfort during this hour, Help my assert be careful what I say, and may I not speak too much about things I know nothing about. And help me, Father, to speak carefully and cautious the words of wisdom along these lines, and look to thee to minister and apply where needed. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now I read several times in the Gospels where this thing happens. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, it says, When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the even come, he was there alone. The Germans have an expression for it. They call it ganz allein. And if you listen to much uh, German folk music, you'll hear that expression over and over again. Ganz allein, ganz allein, ganz allein. Meaning holy, all, completely, ganz. Holy, alone, completely alone. And I talked this morning about loneliness. When I talk about loneliness, I'm talking about a thing that's common to any member of the human race. Folks sometimes accuse, accuse me of being too theological and too doctrinal and too impractical. And I don't believe it. I think they're slandering me and lying about me. If my preaching isn't as practical as any man you ever heard in your life, my name ain't Peter S. Now, I may not be practical all the time, but I'll tell you, brother, these things like loneliness and jealousy and self-pity and self-love and laziness and covetousness and the fear of man are just as practical as any you have picked up in all your life. And I'm going to talk to you about loneliness. I'm going to say a number of things about it. I'm going to talk about the fear of loneliness, the universality of loneliness, the curse of loneliness, the blessing of loneliness, and the cure for loneliness from a biblical context. First of all, the fear of loneliness. Did you know that people are afraid of being alone from the time they're born to the time they die? And loneliness shows no respect for age. Little babies are afraid of being left alone. A baby cry when it's been left alone a while. Just wants you to pick it up. That's all. Nothing wrong with the kid. He just doesn't want to be alone. And young people, they're afraid to be alone. Folks say in these uh, colleges and universities and high schools, the kids want the gang spirit. They want the spirit of togetherness. It's because they're scared. Because they're scared. Folks are afraid of being alone. And I'm going to talk about that more later. Did you know most Japanese mothers, maybe not all the new ones, but all the old ones, you know what they did? When their baby was born, after their baby got to be about six months old, they put that baby back in the room for a couple of days and just left it. And nobody ministered to it crying, nobody tended to it, nobody took care of it. And there isn't a hardly a Japanese born in Japan that doesn't have that in his background. And that's to make them hard, make them stoic, make them fatalistic, 
Make them so they can take it. Now, you don't have to feel too sorry for them. They go and tend to them for a while, after a while. But that's just uh, prepare them for life, man. Prepare them for life. It wasn't through hatred or indifference. The Spartans used to take young boys when they were 10 years old and turn them loose in the woods, and brother, it was root hog or die. I'm just turn them loose in the woods, 10 years old. Make you live in any way you can make it. And when they were 15, they were brought out and whipped publicly at the public festival. And by the time those boys were 20 years old, man, let me tell you something. When they say it's like a Spartan, they meant, they meant this one. They meant those birds could fight. They're tough. They're tough. They began at 10. The fear of being alone is common to babies. The fear of being alone is common to young people. Young people nearly always hang out in pairs or gangs. And when I find two uh, young men that are just hanging out together all the time, or two young women that are just all together all the time, they don't have any other friends. Just always these two together, and always these two together. You know what it usually is? It's usually just a great big griping session. And I've never hardly known that thing to fail. When I find two young men that are just as stuck together as Siamese twins and never have fellowship with anybody else, you know what they're doing? They're belly aching to each other. That's what they're doing. And I've seen that thing in churches and seen that thing in schools and seen it in the army. And the same goes for women. When you find two women that have no other friends except just the two of them, they're just complaining to each other. That's all they're doing. And the idea is they're afraid to get out and afraid to be alone and afraid to bust contact. They take confidence in each other and share confidence. Then they're scared each one to blackmail the other one. <laughs> just the kind of a clandestine fellowship there. <laughs> all right, they get people are afraid of being alone when they're young. And when they get old, it doesn't get any better. Matter of fact, it gets worse. Older folks get, the more they are afraid to be alone. People say, well, I'm liable to fall down. Who'd pick me up? Ladies say, I broke my hip, slip in the bathtub, nobody to help me. And when people get up around 60, 70, 80, they're scared to death to be by themselves because they feel like they're helpless. So when I talk about the fear of loneliness, I'm talking about something that's common to every person in this building. And the reason why young people sometimes are thick as custard is when they get together, they can talk over dirty things with each other. They can't talk over their parents. And they get an ironclad bond of fellowship there because each one is confiding the other something they shouldn't be confiding. It's the fear of being alone. All right? The universality of loneliness. It's not only universal in regards to age, it's universal in regards to any type or kind of person. Famous men have been lonely. Paul says at the end of his ministry, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You think a man like Paul, when he died, have a football stadium of people waiting to go by his casket. I don't read about one of them. Come to the end of Paul's life, say, how you doing, Paul? Oh, I'm about to get it in the neck, literally. And I say, uh, your wife with you? No wife. Your children with you? No children. You've been abandoned, I guess, by God and man. Uh, no, the Lord's with me. How about your sons? They're not here. Any grandsons? No grandsons. No great-grandsons? No great-grandsons. How about your sister, your brother, your uncle, your nephew? Nobody here, just me. He says, only Luke is with me. One man, right toward the end, one man, alone. Alone, brother, and a famous man. If any man ought to have company, you'd think a fellow that wrote a third of the New Testament would have some company, wouldn't you? But he didn't. He is alone. Folks, I want to be a movie star. They're always popular. They always have so many boyfriends and girlfriends. They're always in the limelight. They always have the camera. You can be lonely there, too, brother. Uh, some of those movie stars are the loneliest people in the world, and that's why they kill themselves. Those people like Marilyn Monroe and those people like James Main Man, whatever her name was, those kind of people that, that when they get up there in light, life and somebody talks to them, people like Hedy Lamar and Greta Garbo and that bunch, you'll find they're the loneliest people in the face of this earth. The greatest philosopher Germany ever produced was a man named Hegel. And Hegel was a philosopher's philosopher, man. I mean, Karl Marx got everything he got from Hegel. You know what Hegel said before he died? He said, nobody understands me. He said, there's only one man in all of Germany that understands me, and he don't understand me. <laughs> lonely, lonely. Did you know loneliness can come upon you in peculiar places? When I was a young man, I used to watch New Year's Eve, you know. Of course, they didn't even have television those days. You had to get over the newsreel, you know, at the movies. And they showed this big crowd in Times Square, and they packed in like sardines, man. You couldn't move without somebody moving right next to you. And here were maybe, uh, oh, 20, 30,000 people all jammed in and blowing horns, you know, and blowing these paper things come out the mouth and throwing confetti around, ringing bells, you know. And I used to look at that when I was about 10 or 11. Boy, I thought I sure I could get there, you know, all those people. 
I always felt kind of by myself. You know, I get in that bunch, boy, I'd have a lot of... Boy, I had a good time then. When I got to be about 16, I ran away from home, bus and rail and stuff up there, and got up there, and I've been in Times Square New Year's Eve. I never felt more alone in all my life. <laughs> <laughs> there was no communication, no contact, man, just another desolation. And you know something? A lot of sick people over in the county old folks' home and the hospitals and rest homes, that when they see that thing on New Year's Eve, their heart just aches. They think, boy, what should I get out and get with those people? Boy, aren't they having a good time? And if you get there, you just be as lonely as if you're on a desert island. I mean, you don't know anybody, all a bunch of strangers. But it looks good in mass, but you get in it. It isn't much. It isn't much. Loneliness can come upon you in the strangest places. You know something a man or woman can be married for 20 years. When they sit down in the living room, there's six feet of rug between them and their mate. It's just as good as 1,500 miles. Did you know that? Sometimes they can sit there in her mind way off over here and his mind way off over there, and there's no fellowship, no communion, no companionship or nothing. I like that story about a fellow married one woman for about 40 years, and she died. And the preacher said, now, Sam, he said, uh, don't take it too hard now. You and that woman been one flesh for 40 years. going to be kind of hard, you know, getting used to being by yourself for a while. And he said, preacher, said, I'll tell you the truth. He said, uh, Rebecca sure was a good wife to me, and I sure did love her. He said, but you know something? All that time we were married, he said, I just never did get to like her. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's a great thing to love somebody. It's even better to like them. You know that? And you know, in some of those marriages, there's no companionship at all. It's just one unit sitting here and one unit sitting over there. Toughen it out, man. It can come in peculiar places. Did you ever stop and think about this? When you finally come time to die and somebody's got your coffin ready right now, they're making your coffin right now. They, they keep them stocked in advance. Maybe it's already made, I don't know. But everybody in this building's got a coffin on the way. And you ever stop thinking about this? Uh, when it comes time to die, nobody has any companionship. You say, well, I'm going to have my loved ones by my bed and hold my hand and all this and that and other thing. Yeah, but they can't step out of your body for you. You're in your body. To this prison, I'm in this body by myself. I take it back. There's two of them in here, but if you're unsafe, you wouldn't understand that. What I'm saying is, uh, me, I've got to step out of this body like this, and you can't step out for me. I don't care how much comfort you give a dying person. When you take that step, you take that step all by your lonesome. But nobody will take it for you. And that person sitting there in that chair, sitting on that bed, when you go, they just sit there and look at you. They don't go with you. Death is a lonely thing. Well, we all die. So I'm talking about a universal subject, man. You all experience loneliness. And if you haven't, you will. All right, now I'm going to talk a while about the curse of loneliness. The Bible said about Adam, it's not a good thing for the man to be alone. I'll make him a help meet for him. And the Lord must something, uh, thought there was something wrong with being alone. The curse of loneliness. There are three things being lonely and getting lonely can cause you to do with the bad. In the first place, when you spend a lot of time alone, you'll be tempted to compromise and go along in order to get company. Number two, you'll be tempted to make unholy alliances. Number three, you'll make tragic decisions. There's many a person that made a decision because they felt alone and left out, but later they wish they'd stayed alone and left out. Now, that's a dying truth. Now, you take this nation right here we live in, the United States. You know why we're in the mess we're in today? Now, I'm talking politically. I'm not talking morally or socially. I mean, that's got to do with Hollywood and some other things. But politically, politically. You know why we're in the mess we're in today? Because we had a coin, and on this coin, it said, In God we trust. And two times overseas, a little old country about the side of Oregon rose up. Are you listening, Professor? About two times, a little old country about the size of Oregon rose up over there. And that country took on every major power in its time. And we watched that little old country go, and we said, if we leave them alone, they'll conquer Europe, and then they're liable to get us. So we said, instead of trusting God, in God we trust, we'll make alliances. And in World War I, we made an alliance with a country that professed to be an atheistic country from the French Revolution. World War I, I'm not talking about World War II. As it about 20 years later, got this little coin that says, In God We Trust, and there's an eagle on there. 
Ought to have been a chicken. <laughs> anyway, we said, this little old country about the size of Oregon rose up, and it began to give the world a fit again. This time it took on Russia, England, France, United States, brought them to a standstill for four years, and America said, boy, if we let those folks alone, man, and I will take this and I will take that, we're going to be in a mess. We better join up with them Russians. And in World War II, we joined up with a country that not only professed to be atheist, but taught it people atheism, taught it in the schools, practiced it, professed it, promoted it, encouraged it, and we quit trusting God, we trusted Russia, and ain't we in a pretty pickle now? How's the weather, girls? <laughs> We've had it, man. We said we'll send them tanks, we sent them hundreds of tanks, thousands of tanks, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and we got out of it temporarily, and we sure got in some, didn't we? You know what our trouble was? We were afraid to be alone. Afraid of somebody to say, isolationist, all by yourself. See, we're scared. And when you get scared and get alone, you make mistakes. Compromise, unholy alliances. Do you know why this ecumenical movement is prospering so much in America? Because all over America, the doors are closing on Sunday night. And all over America, pastors are saying, we can't reach the young people. We can't reach the young people. We can't reach the young people. You know why you can't reach the young people? Because you're dealing with a generation that's raised on Hollywood via that too. That's your generation gap right there. And if I were to tell you what preachers are doing in America to reach people, it puts your hair on end. If I were to tell you what preachers are doing just to try to fill up their seats, it just it just shocks you to death. I mean, man, it's more than just giving away ponies and suckers and hiding dollar bills under the bus seats. There's more to it than that, and, and 300 yard footlongs and two acre hamburgers. That's a small amount, man. Why, listen, there, there are churches in this country that are having nudes posed in the pulpit. There are churches in this country that have many skirted belly dancers dance up and down the aisle of jazz bands, man, Sunday morning. What for? The ethnic dialogue, they communicate with a relative touch to the. Ah, no, that ain't it, man. That ain't it. You know what the trouble is? Lost the touch. Lost the word, no Holy Spirit, no power, no magnet, no conviction. That's what the trouble is. And you know what they're doing? They're all getting together. You know why they're getting together? To boost their tenants, to keep the whole cotton-picking thing fall apart. That's what's going on. You know what the trouble is? They're getting left alone. They're scared. They're scared. And when you get scared, you make unholy alliances. When you get alone and get alone too much, you make tragic decisions. Being lonely all the time, wanting company, has forced many a young person into company you never should have been in. Folks say, well, birds of a feather flock together. Well, I've seen many a good, godly Christian young person flock with the wrong crowd because they were lonely and couldn't go it alone. You take Saul. Once upon a time, the nation of Israel said, we haven't got a king to go out in and out before us and fight our battles. What are we going to do? And the Lord said, trust me. And they said, yeah, but you can't ride a horse. <laughs> and you don't shoot straight. What we need is a king like all the nations round about us to fight our battles. The Lord said, why don't you fight your own battles? And they said, make us a king, make us a king. And God made him a king. And boy, by the time they had him ten years, they wish they'd never even seen him. You know what their trouble was? They felt alone. They got scared. They made that decision when they were alone, and they got in trouble. You can make decisions, bad marriages when you get alone. You get by yourself and get tired of toughing out alone, put us in your old, older sister gets married. That's what hurts, boy. That older sister gets married, boy, the competition got to keep up. Then you'll have to make the biggest mess you ever saw. Why? There's a curse to loneliness. It can get you in trouble. I have people come to me all the time, talk about marriage problems, divorce problems, separation problems. A young lady in this church one time said to me, and she's happily married now, I'm here, and I wouldn't think it makes any name, but she came to me one time and she said, well, Brother Ruffin, she said, uh, about a certain marriage, she said, she said, should I marry him? And I said, well, I guess both, you're both Christians, I guess it'll work out all right. She said, but I don't love him. And she said, do you have to love somebody to marry him? And I said, yes. Now, I don't know where I got that from. I couldn't find that in the Scripture. <laughs> you know, when you get in the Scripture for dating and marriage, you run into a dearth man sometimes. But I'll tell you one thing, sister, if you don't love him, you better have him marry him. You know what she told me? She said, well, if I tell him I don't love him, it'll hurt him. And I said, okay, go ahead and marry him. She said, yeah, but then I'm liable to hurt him later. And I said, well, then maybe you better hurt him now. 
And she said, well, if I hurt him later, it'll probably be worse than right now. I said, yeah, it probably will be. So she hurt him then. And better hurt him then than later on after he's got a family. You make tragic decisions when you're alone. All right, I'm talking about the blessings of loneliness. You have the curse of loneliness, you have the blessings. Why, you know, everything has two sides. You've got two sides. The coin's got two sides. The Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And when I talk about loneliness, I'm not talking about something that's incurable and will damn you forever. It's got a good side to it, too. I mean, look, coin's got two sides. All right, number one. If you have to spend a lot of time alone and God puts you in a lonely place, I'll tell you one thing right now it's going to do for you. It's going to give you a deeper understanding of yourself and it's going to give you a deeper understanding of God. That book says, Be still and know that I am God. I saw a quotation one time and it said, Be still and know. That's one of these university things, you know. No, that ain't it. It's be still and know that I am God. You, if you, you want to understand human nature, just lock yourself in a room about three days. Study yourself. Well, you find out you're so treacherous <laughs> and deceitful. Folks, I just don't understand people. Spend some time with yourself, you understand them. Somebody says, I want to, I want to, young people say, I want to identify. I want self-realization. I'll tell you how to do it, honey. Just get your boat, go right up there in the back end of the swamp, up Tennessee River and Alabama River, go way back there and park that boat up there in those gum stumps and cypress roots, back there, them, those, those, those deer and possum and all them, those, whatever it is, things up in there, and you get back up in there and just get out there and get down your face in that mud and have it out with the Lord about eight hours, you'll identify. Scares you, though, don't it? Scares you. You know how people are scared to be alone? They see that old depravity in there. See, it scares them. It scares them. Well, listen, if you folks say, Lord, give me wisdom. Help me to be more understanding. I'll tell you how to be more understanding. Get alone. You want to understand people? Spend some time with yourself. Turn the radio off. Turn the television off. Don't always have somebody blabbing your ear and talking, having coffee with you and cutting cake with you. Get rid of the newspaper. Instead of always having somebody banging something in your ear, get alone. Get it quiet. Turn the stuff off. Let me see how it goes. You get an understanding. You get an understanding of human nature. You get an understanding of depravity. You come out a Bible believer. I'll guarantee you. I'll tell you something else. You know more about God. How in the world are you ever going to get to know God if you just spend all your time with a racket in your ears and all your time in company? How are you going to do it? How in the world is any man in Pensacola going to get to know God? You get up Monday morning. Get up there, bran flakes, vitamin pills, black coffee, brrrm, slam on down there, pile of fox, brrrm, 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 on down the neighbor air station, bumper to bumper, beep, 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 go on now, get the neighbor air station, folding flap tops on a box all day long, you know, whatever you're doing out there, and flipping something over and flipping something over, knock off the lunch, grab the beer, smoke the cigarette, back to work, get off at 3.30 in the afternoon, brrrm, down pile of fox, beep, beep, line up behind the lights, get home, run in the house, take off your shoes, Sit down there, gulp down the meal, watching the newscast, 6 o'clock, turn on the boob tube, watch five guys get killed, three of them throwing off horses, six of them drown, somebody murders, stab somebody, get the 10 o'clock news, get in bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, man, let me ask you something. How in the world are you ever going to get to know God like that? You know, a fellow is like that and comes into Sunday morning and figures Sunday morning he'll get enough to last him through the week. Why, you're out of your mind. You, you can't do that. The way to get to know God is uh, get alone. Get alone. You get to know him. You get walking up and down that house, you know, and just turn that mess off for a while. Listen, if you're a child of God, doesn't the Holy Spirit dwell in your body? Didn't he say, the Lord has said, I'll never leave you to forsake thee, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. When you walk up and down that house, turn off that stuff until you get used to him. <laughs> I mean, he's your Savior. Well, get, get acquainted with him, huh? And just cut out the rest. you get used to him. It isn't as bad as you think it is. <laughs> he, may, he may talk to you about some things, but you get used to his company. Get you down and appreciate each other. <laughs> Folks say, you know, they're going to college get this self-realization. They always have a big word for it. They always have some words, you know. You can always spot this bunch with these great swelling words like 
self-realization for the entire community, for the total involvement of the pilot community, for the environmental social creature who should have civic identity because the social creature is a basic ingredient in the interrelated structure where the coordinated guidelines should form a flexible format of liberalized program with tentative goals for community involvement where the totalized facilities should be a total community with related standing to the ethnic dialogue in sexual awareness for the total involvement. Boom! <laughs> you know, you know, uh, I, I don't have to tell you this, but you know a lot of me has never grown up. <laughs> um, you can tell that. You can tell I always have more feel, you know, the kid's 15 and I will post 50. And, you know... <laughs> That's all right. You're supposed to get a blessing. You're supposed to enjoy it. <laughs> Amen. And I'll tell you, well, I, I, I'm like these kids, you know. I used to go to movies when I was a kid, and, and whenever they put on the mush, that's the love scene, you know. Boo! <laughs> we would all hiss and boo, you know. And, you know, I never changed much along those lines. And when I, when I read a bunch of garbage like that put out by MAs and PhDs and and uh, governors and big businessmen and fellows make $60,000 a year. You know what my reaction is? Boo! <laughs> Get him off the stage, man. Ain't nothing to that. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to talk about the cure for loneliness. The cure for loneliness. The blessing, you can have a deeper understanding of God. You can have a deeper understanding of yourself. And you, if you're not listening, if you're not convinced about these things, about total depravity, you will be if you spend enough time by your lonesome. Now I'm going to talk about the cure. There are three things you can do with loneliness. And I hope you do one of these. All right, in the first place, utilize it when you got it, when you have it. You may not always have it. My life has always been kind of a, a extreme. It's just been completely by myself or a mall. But no in-between in ground, no middle ground. And I'll tell you, there have been times when I've been alone, I wish I had some company, and there have been times I had more company than I'd care to have. <laughs> and I'll tell you, some of you folks have got plenty of company, and when you get a little time alone, you'll do something with it. You say, what? Well, learn how to knit. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, ladies, of course. <laughs> uh, learn how to sew, you know. I mean, learn how to cook. Teach yourself a musical instrument. Do something with it. You say, I don't want to do that. Well, it'll drive you bugs. Use that time. Bible says, redeem the time. The days are evil. I read the paper the other day where a Japanese soldier on Guam surrendered. <laughs> He'd been there 28 years. <laughs> 28 years. You know, that's no surprise to me, you see. But, but I want to ask you something. How can Rusk and Dulles in the State Department talk about peace talks in France when dealing with the same kind of people and think they're going to do anything. Brother, let me tell you, the man will hold out for 28 years, you ain't going to whip him. You ain't going to whip him. If I will hold out 28 years by himself, what would he do with an army? <laughs> Folks talk about, come home with a victory in Vietnam. I ain't going to have no victory. You ain't going to have no victory unless you annihilate him. You know how long they'll fight? They'll fight the Lord comes back and leaves again. <laughs> One fellow there held out for 28 years. Now, I've asked myself, I wonder what he did with his spare time. <laughs> what do you reckon that fellow did in 28 years all by himself? Did you ever think about that? I mean, suppose the Lord gave you 28 years, just you. I think he had, he had two or three buddies, and, and a couple of them died earlier. What would you do? The Bible says, redeem the time, the days are evil. Do something with it. Develop character. You have to develop character. You fight against yourself. Paul said to keep my body under, bring it into subjection. You know why I have such a lack of character in this country? Because a lot of kids that never gotten alone fought the battle out. Did you ever fight it out? You know how you develop character? You develop character by fighting against insurmountable odds. That's how you develop it. You say, well, I fought the good fight, and I've been whipped a hundred times. Okay, let's go a hundred and one. Get up and go again. Fight! When Paul said, I fought a good fight, he wasn't talking about going out and hitting people in the mouth. <laughs> he wasn't talking around going on the brethren and trying to cause trouble and split them up. When Paul said, I fought a good fight, he's talking about a warfare in himself and a warfare with the devil. He can develop character. I go up in these uh, places in the summer up north and preach to uh, hundreds of young people. 
And sometime when I get up there and look at those kids, I mean, many times I've seen 2,000 sitting there, the youngest 13, the oldest 20. I look at those kids, and sometimes I see them, my heart just sinks down my boots, associates with my brain. And I look at them, I look out there across them, and when I look out across them, I think to myself, boy, now all this bunch of get saved, not 2% of them ever mount the hill of beans. And they won't. You know why they, they won't? They've never fought in the battles, and if they ever fought them, they lost every one they ever fought. No character. Listen, the kids up there that want to do right, they want to live pure, they want to live clean, they love God, and they want to do right. And listen, if they wanted to do right and tried their best to do right and made up their mind to do right and put their will behind it, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. I recognize it. I see that generation a lot weaker along those lines than I am. And I'm a lot weaker than my father was. And I know my father was weaker than my grandfather was. That's some evolution, isn't it? I mean, each generation goes a little bit further, you see. Weak. No character. Develop character when you buy yourself. Redeem the time. Learn how to do something. Learn how to write poetry. Learn how to draw. Learn how to paint. You never saw an artist in your life but learn how to paint with a crowd around. Some of my ladies play the piano. Now, you can't kid me. She didn't learn how to play that piano with 15 people leaning on the piano all the time. Somebody said, well, the teacher was there. No, she wasn't. If you think you can learn how to play an instrument just when the teacher's there, you never learn how to play one. It's practice, man. It's practice. It's alone. It's alone. A fellow said to me one time, he said, I sure wish I could draw like you. Draw? How'd you learn how to draw? Being by myself. You said, how long? Hours, 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 days, weeks, months, years. You know what I've done? I've gone out in the mountains of Japan in the winter and sat down there and used melted snow for water, for watercolors, painting those mountain ranges in Japan. I've climbed up a tree in Hawaii, in Oahu, in Nepali, and used my canteen for water, for watercolors, and sat there hours, and hours, and hours, and hours, and hours. So, so I'm not willing to pay the price. Okay, don't pay it. But if you get along, don't waste the time. what I'm trying to say. All right, number two. Accept God's provision for your loneliness. Accept it. The Bible says, My God shall supply all your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Paul said he learned whatever state he was in, therewith to be content. Accept God's provision. God has a book. God has some answers in his book. Go to his book and study his book when you get along. You know, in the last ten years, we've had a wave of what I call hippie agnostic songs. And I don't listen to them, just occasionally. But you can't eat in a restaurant without some fool beating a guitar in your brains and trying to beat your brains out with it. And so you hear them, you know. And these songs like, Who Am I? You know. What is truth? And who's to blame? And who will answer? And who knows? And how are you? And who cares? You know. <laughs> you get all these songs going, you know. Some guy gets his brain knocked out in the demonstration. Who will answer? You know. Some guy can't get in the school he wants to go, who will answer? I don't care who answers. And all this stuff, you know, why God has the answer. Somebody says, who cares? The Lord cares. Somebody says, what is true? Thy word is true. Somebody says, who knows? What's going to happen? The Lord's going to come. That's what's going to happen. Oh, Johnny Cash, get up there and say, what is true? What is true? Well, I wouldn't brag about the ignorance if I was you. <laughs> I mean, we know what the truth is. Thy word is true. Guy sat there, agnostic drunk. What is true? What is true? Young person sitting there saying, "Well, if he don't know, I don't guess I'm find out." You know. Thing you do is that's right. Thing you do is when you get time alone, like get in the book and find out the truth. All right. Last of all, believe God's promises about Christ's companionship. Christ said, "I don't leave you comfortless. I send a Comforter that He may dwell with you forever." And if you want to know the real difference between a saved man and a lost man, I could boil it down real quick. An unsaved man is a man that goes through his troubles alone. And a saved man is a man that goes through his troubles with somebody helping bear the burden. Now, essentially, that's the difference. Now, I'm not talking doctrinally. So I'm not talking about new birth and salvation and atonement. I'm talking about a practical condition. And if you're unsaved here this morning, I'll tell you one great big difference between you and me that you'll never get over. And that is when you get alone, you're alone. And I mean, the only company you've got is a devil and unclean spirits. And when I'm alone, I am never completely alone. Because that old book says the Holy Spirit indwells my body and I have this treasure 
in an earthen vessel. There's always two of us here. Like the old song says, no, never alone, no, never alone. And sometimes it gets kind of rough. I heard a man say one time, he said, God gave that fellow a lemon for life. You know, the Lord squeezed out a portion. You know, give one fellow sugar, one fellow honey, one fellow Tabasco sauce, one fellow vitriolic acid, and give another one a lemon, you know. And he said, God gave him a lemon, so he just made a lemonade out of it, <laughs> which is good if you can do it. And if the Lord has given you those lonely hours, and it's a lemon for you, then make lemonade out of it. An old poem says, two men looked out from prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. Like a fellow says, depends how you look at it. I mean, two men looked out from prison bars. I'm in jail. I've been in jail now for 50 years. There's a jail, see. Old Job said, you fenced me in with bone, sinew, and skin. The jail. I'm in prison. Paul says, who should deliver me? He's in jail. Jail. Wait for the warden to take the key. And I'm in jail. I look out between the bars, see. I look out between the bars. Sometimes I see mud, and sometimes I see stars. Two men looked out through prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. And listen, if you're unsaved, you look out there, there's just the old decayed, rotten humus of human nature, mud. And if you're saved, it stars. It stars. Did you ever stop to think about what a lonely man the Lord Jesus Christ must have been? I mean, you stop and think about it. All those crowds, and always that congregation, and always people coming for help, and always people coming to get healed, and always people coming for advice. And one of his disciples out there trying to sell him out while he was doing it. And one fellow trying to get the bag and talking about contributions and he's going to steal the money. You get all that kind of thing. And all these people around him, you know, and Thomas sitting right next to him, doubting him the whole time. Simon Peter sitting right next to him, ready to fight, and he couldn't fight, so then he began to cuss. And you think about all that stuff, and I don't find anybody in the book that even understood it, unless it was John. And if it was John, he only had one. When it got dark, John took Mary home. You talk about a lonely life. If you're sitting here this morning, you know I'm saying, man or woman, I'll tell you something. I can recommend somebody to you that knows more about it than you'll ever know. You talk about lack of understanding. My, 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 my. If the Lord Jesus Christ were to come here this morning and allow me to put him on the sand and quiz him and give him the third degree, you know how to run, run something like this. I'd say, uh, well, you're a great man in your life, weren't you? And he'd say, well, you date your birthday for mine. That's pretty good, see. I mean, not everybody in the world uh, fixes the birthday that determines the rest of them. You've got to admit that's a little out of the usual. And I say, well, you, how many people did you heal? Oh, 15,000. How many blind people did you restore to sight? Oh, 400. How many lepers did you heal? Oh, 40. How many dead people did you raise? Oh, three or four. Four or five. And I said, boy, I bet when you died, they really put out an extra, didn't they? It wasn't even mentioned. You don't find the death of Jesus Christ mentioned in any secular history in this world. You find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Boy, can he died, there wasn't any extra. Saying, this noble man that did so much to liberate humanity, this man that beat the drum for the oppressed minorities, this brilliant revolutionists that set the common man free and taught them to sing, we shall overcome. Not a word! Not a word. I'd say, well, Jesus, what kind of a funeral did you have? I bet there were a lot of folks there, wasn't there? I bet old Pilate and Herod came out and all the kin folk. I bet the photographers took the picture of the casket. I bet they drew that thing through Jerusalem on a mule, maybe, you know, and kept the thing on three or four hours. No, they didn't. Pilate wasn't there. I said, well, was Herod there? No, he wasn't there. I'd say, well, how about the funeral procession? Did you have a big, long procession? No, they took me down in the middle of the night and buried me in another man's tomb. got dark. They wouldn't give me a daylight funeral. I'd say, well, I just can't understand that. How many people came to your funeral? How about those 20, 30,000? Any of them there? And six of them were there. Mary Salomino, Mary Magdalene, Mary Cleopas, Nicodemus, Joseph Arimathea, maybe Barabbas. I've always thought Barabbas was there. That ain't in the scripture, but it's kind of scriptural. And he says, six of them came to the tomb. I said, boy, I bet you had a great burial. He said, they just rolled the stone over the tomb. I said, what was your epitaph? What was that on your tomb? I mean, healing people, getting sick folks saved, and healing, raising the dead, and still in the water in the sea. Boy, I bet the sign that's really gave something to you. Oh, you have a lot of flowers for funeral? Not even a rose. 
I had to bury him in the garden to get his flowers. I said, what did they put on your tomb? Nothing, nothing, nothing. You know, when the great men of this world die, they make great speeches. And when General MacArthur died, boy, you never heard such oration and eulogy. And Michael Luther King Jr. died, you never heard such talking in all your life. And when Jesus Christ died, nobody said boo. And when JFK got shot, they put by his grave an eternal flame. And my Savior got crucified by wicked men and nailed to a cruel cross. They put him there and they rolled across that stone and they didn't even write, here lies Jesus Christ, born 4 B.C., died 30 A.D. Why, you give that privilege to your children and your mother. And if you went out there in the Naval Air Station, you'd find them all around there, born, died, born, died. And some of them had big old plaques on them like that, out of bronze and marble, and sometimes eight, nine, ten lines, sometimes a poem on there. I said, Jesus, what they write in your tomb? He said, nothing, nothing. I said, well, something. Did you put your name on the tomb? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Alone, 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 alone. And listen, if you're not saved, you trust him as your Savior, and you'll have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. All right, let's stand for prayer. Father, we're thankful the souls have been saved this week. We're thankful the souls that have been saved in this church and confessed it before men. We're thankful he's come tonight to be baptized. You've been so good to us. We're thankful for our people that love thee and been faithful in witnessing. We're thankful for the fruits you've given them and their labors in the last few days. And Father, I pray if there's anybody here this morning that's done to say, they'll pay attention to what I've said and give heed to it and understand I'm not just talking, but these things are real and true. Holy Spirit of God, bear witness to what I've said. You're here. You in all these old mortal frames that are headed for dust and ashes. Witness now. Bear, bear witness the truth, Lord. You wrote the book. Bear witness the truth and speak the hearts of the unsaved. Heads bowed and eyes are closed to the innocent prayer. While the musicians are playing, how many of you folks can raise your hand and say, Brother Ruckman, I have received Jesus Christ my Savior the best way I know how, the best of my ability I have received him. And this morning, I know I'm saved by faith. And I'm raising my hand as a testimony. Would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? Praise the Lord. Thank you. Put them down. I saw a lady then raise a hand that wasn't saved here two weeks ago. Sometime the last two weeks, she's made the decision. Brother Sutek said out there this morning, he met a young man that was saved under his preaching last summer, right here in this building. Never made a move, but he got saved. Now listen, you don't have to make any move with your feet to get saved, but you've got to make a move with your will. You've got to say, Lord, I will. I will trust your son. I will receive him as my Savior. Before we close the service, does anybody here this morning raise your hand and say, Preacher, I never have yet received Christ my Savior. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Would you hold your hand up? You never have. All right, if nobody will close. Anybody here this morning? You have not received me as your Savior. You'd say, pray for me. I'm not a Christian, not a child of God. Pray for me. The Bible says, for your saved, you are alone in this world. Alone. Alone in this world without hope and without God. 